All right, Revelation chapter 5, let's begin at verse 1, and let's read the word of the Lord together. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Over the years I've been in full-time vocational ministry, it's been my experience that most people approach the book of the Revelation with a certain sense of foreboding. The pictures it presents and the language it uses are often confusing. It's often hard to determine what parts are figurative, what parts are symbolic, and what parts are literal. Sometimes it's difficult to know whether a passage is speaking of an event that is happening in the present, something that occurred in the past, or something that is yet to come in the future. Some people get frightened by the talk of such things as dragons and plagues and battles and martyrs and bottomless pit that is contained in the book. I freely confess that I don't have the definitive answer to all the questions that surround this intriguing book. What I am confident of is that there are two overarching dominant themes that should guide any discussion of this book. The first is contained in the very first words of the book, the revelation of Jesus Christ. When you boil it all down, this isn't a book about seals and trumpets and bowls. This isn't a book about antichrist and tribulation. Oh, sure, those things are in the book, but that isn't the focus. This is a book about Jesus. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the focus of this book. Jesus is the hero of this book. Don't get alarmed by the description of a great battle where the blood runs as deep as the bridles of the horses or by a mark of the beast being required to buy or sell. Don't even allow yourself to become distracted by the awe-inspiring description of the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven. Keep your eyes on Jesus. This is a book about Jesus. The second great theme of this book is closely connected to the first. You might even say they go hand in glove. It's the theme of worship, specifically worship of Jesus. This is the theme that is sounded in chapters 4 and 5. As chapter 4 opens, the beloved elder John is given a vision of an open door in heaven and a voice like the sound of a trumpet invites him to come up into that celestial place. A spectacular scene unfolds before him. He is able to see the throne of God. There's an emerald rainbow around the throne. 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns upon their heads are around the throne. There are flashes of lightning and peals of thunder. There are seven lamps of fire. There's a sea of glass like crystal. There are four living creatures, each of them with the face of a lion, a calf, a man, and an eagle. Each of them have six wings full of eyes in front and behind. These creatures continually cry out night 
night and day. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the cry of holy goes forth, the 24 elders fall down before the one on the throne and cast their crowns at his feet and worship him by saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. I tell you, it's an awe-inspiring sight. And then John is shown a scroll written on the front and the back, sealed with seven seals. The information about the events that are to transpire at the end of the age is contained in this scroll, but the seals have to be broken so that the message can be revealed. John begins to weep profusely because there is no one in heaven, on the earth, or under the earth that is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. And this appears to be the end of it until one of the elders speaks up and says, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. John opens his eyes and beholds the strangest sight. Instead of a magnificent beast of the jungle roaring in strength and pride and power when he says, the lion from the tribe of Judah, that's what you would expect. Instead of that, he sees a slaughtered lamb. The lion is a lamb, and the lamb is a lion. Well, the disparity doesn't seem confusing to anybody in heaven because when the, this lion lamb takes the scroll, the 24 elders fall down and start singing another song of worship that says, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood. Men from every tongue and tribe and people and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign upon the earth. And then the innumerable heavenly host picks up the refrain and sings, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Finally, every created being in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, in the sea, joins their voices in a thunderous anthem of worship to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Now, now, this is the first scene of worship in the book of the Revelation. But throughout the remainder of the book, over and over again, the lamb is lifted up for worship. No matter what else is revealed, regardless of how disheartening or confusing or frightening or disturbing, the attention is always brought back to focus on the lamb. And for the next few minutes, I'd like to invite you to join with John the Revelator and the heavenly host and the 24 elders and the vast company of the redeemed. I'd like you to join with all of them and behold the Lamb. First, I'd like you to behold him as the Creator Lamb. In chapter 4, verse 11, the 24 elders cast their crowns before the throne of the Almighty and say, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. Watch this. For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. Then in chapter 5, when John beholds the lamb that is the lion that is a slaughtered lamb, this lion lamb is ascribed the same worship as the one sitting on the throne. And that is as it should be. For when the Bible declares in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the word God is Elohim, 
which is a plural form of the word God. This personal God who called into existence by the exercise of his will things that had not been is not just God the Father, but it is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bringing forth something out of nothing. That's why the Gospel of John says in its prologue, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Watch this. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. The rest of that chapter establishes conclusively that when it talks about the Word, that this Word was indeed Jesus. That's what it means in verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. While it is true that all creation can be ascribed to God the Father, it is equally true that God never acts independently. He always acts through the agency of the Son. That's the meaning of Hebrews 1 and 2. God in these last days has spoken to us in His Son through whom also he made the world. That's the meaning of Colossians 1 and 16. For by Jesus all things were created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Now let me break that down for you just a little bit. This verse declares that Jesus is the ground of creation, both in heaven and on on earth. He is simultaneously its means and its end. This verse all declares, also declares that Jesus the Lamb is supreme over the universe. He created all spheres, whether in the heavens above or the earth beneath. There is no locality he did not bring into existence. Beyond that, he created the nature of all things, some visible, some invisible. Furthermore, he created all the inhabitants of those spheres, whether thrones, lordships, principalities, or dominions. The invisible beings of the world above us, however lofty their names or however mighty their powers, are his creatures as much as the lowest objects within our sight. Every one of these invisible beings, so great as to be called dominions, so exalted as to be considered principalities, so potent as to merit the designation of powers, every one of them was created by the Lamb of God, and they all acknowledge his supremacy and glory. The highest position in creation is infinitely below him. There is neither majesty nor renown that equal him. Behold the creator lamb. Not only were all things created by him, all things were created for him. Apart from the lamb, there would have been no creation at all. He is the reason for it. He is the first cause and the final cause. He is both alpha and omega of creation. This world with its forests, with its mountains, with its lakes, with its flowing meadow streams, with its flowers, with its fruits, with its birds, with its butterflies, was made so that it was made so beautiful because it is his world. I want you to think it is a mistake to think for one moment that this world was created for humanity. Jesus, not humanity, is the end of creation. As surely as all creation emanated from him, so it all converges again toward him. Behold the creator lamb. Heaven was created for him, for it is the place of his special residence and the future home of the redeemed. Angels were created for him, for they are messengers of his mercy, executors of his will, and executioners of his vengeance. Hell was created for for him, for it is the prison of his justice. Even the earth was created for him, for it is the scene of his incarnation and atoning death, and it is the seat of his mediatorial kingdom. The human race was created for him, for we were created in his image, and we are recreated into that image through the new birth. Jesus, the Lamb, is not only the purpose of creation, he is also the perpetrator of all creation. 
J.B. Phillips translates Colossians 1.17 like this. He is both the first principle and the upholding principle of the whole scheme of creation. Such is the power of this creator lamb that he is the conserver as well as the creator of all things. Behold the creator lamb. Apart from him, atomic fission would explode the universe into fragments. If it were not for him, all things would fall apart and go back into nothingness. All the laws of this universe that regulate and give stability to matter subsist in Jesus and are non-existent outside of him. Robert, this universe finds its completion in Jesus, the creator lamb. And it is sustained and it is preserved every moment by the continuous exercise of his almighty power. His almighty power. All things hang on him. If he withdrew his upholding hand, everything would run into confusion and ruin. He is the center of life, force, motion, and rest. All things revolve around him. He imposes their limits. He gives their laws. He strikes the keynote of their harmonies. He blends and controls their diversity operation. He is the all perfect in the midst of imperfection. He is the unchangeable in the midst of change. Behold the creator lamb. Now this passage invites us to behold the crucified lamb. John says in verse 6 of our text, and I saw a lamb standing as if slain. This is the testimony of John the baptizer in John 1.29. Jesus came to where John was baptizing in the Jordan River. And when John looked up and saw him, he exclaimed, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This was the message of the prophet when he proclaimed in Isaiah 53 and 5. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. This was the testimony of Jesus in Matthew 20 and 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The witness of Revelation 13, 8 is that this was part of the eternal purpose of God from before the beginning of time. For this is the Lamb, the Bible says, who was slain before the foundation of the world. I'm telling you, the death of Jesus wasn't incidental. His death wasn't accidental. His death was fundamental. Behold the crucified Lamb hanging suspended between heaven and earth, dying for the sin of lost humanity. Dying as a substitute so that all who believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Dying to pay the penalty for your sin and my sin. Behold the crucified lamb dying on the cross. Dying in your place. Dying to take your sin. Dying to take your shame. Dying to take your suffering. Behold the crucified lamb on the cross. At the cross, the centurion looked into the face of a dying Jesus and said, truly, this was the Son of God. At the cross, the earth was shaken, the graves were opened, the saints were resurrected from the dead and were seen walking on the streets of Jerusalem. At the cross, the final atonement for sin was offered and a new order was instituted. The veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom so that whosoever will may approach God through Jesus. At the cross, Jesus bore your sin. At the cross, Jesus carried your grief. At the cross, Jesus signed your pardon. At the cross, Jesus paid your ransom. At the cross, Jesus bore your shame in his own nakedness. At the cross, Jesus satisfied the demands of holy God by being the only man to die without sin. At the cross, Jesus conquered your enemies. At the cross, Jesus thwarted Satan's plans. 
At the cross, you were sanctified. At the cross, you were redeemed. At the cross, you were reconciled back to God. At the cross, you were given peace. It is the crucified lamb who is declared worthy to open the seals of the scroll and reveal the final things God has decreed for this world. Behold the crucified lamb. My time's run out, so let me just finish by finally inviting you to behold the conquering lamb. Jesus, uh, John writes in verse 5 of the text, Behold the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome. This lamb is a lion who has overcome. Now I'm about ready to preach. The Apostle Paul wrote about this in Colossians 2.15. He said, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, that's Jesus, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. This is the only time in the New Testament where the word we have translated as disarmed is used. It's a military term. Apec duomai, that literally means to divest wholly or to despoil. Being familiar with the ways of the Roman army, the Apostle Paul chose this word with full knowledge of its meaning and implication. In his book, Let Us See Jesus, Judson Cornwall gives a description of what this might have looked like. When a Roman general conquered his foe, especially if the battle had been long and hard fought, the official surrender often became a formal, full-dress affair with the two leaders facing each other in the presence of their respective armies. You've probably seen something like this in the movies, where the defeated general comes before the conquering general. Well, after the signing of the documents of surrender, the conqueror would step up to the defeated general who stood at rigid attention in his full-dress military uniform, complete with all the insignias, medals, badges, and other symbols of authority that pertain to his position of leadership. And systematically, the conqueror stripped these symbols off the uniform of the defeated general to the accompaniment of beating drums. When every symbol of power, position, rank, and honor had been forcibly ripped from the uniform, the Roman general would announce, now, all of these are mine by right of conquest. What you were, I now am. The titles you once held, I now hold. Your armies will now obey me, and your nation will forever be subject to the rule of Rome. This ritual was called Apec Duomai. And this is the way Paul describes what the conquering lamb did to Satan. He divested Satan of every position of authority and every vestige of power that God had ever given him before he was as expelled from heaven. Can you think of what that scene might have looked like? On one side is the army of Satan, and he is in full regalia of all the power and honor he had ever possessed. On the other side stands Jesus, the conquering lamb, with the host of heaven's armies assembled behind him. Reaching to the uniform of Satan, Jesus rips off the first medal and says, 
you were created Lucifer, which means day star. I hereby strip you of that title forever, for I shall be known as the bright and morning star. Jesus rips off the next medal and says, you held the position of anointed cherub, but now I have the title of the anointed one. And one by one, each medal, each braid, each patch is torn from the uniform. You have functioned as the tempter, but from now on, I will be a guide to mankind. I saw you as lightning falling, ha, but men shall see me as lightning that shines from the east to the west. You were the first creature of God's creation in which music was expressed, but from now on, in the midst of the church, will I sing praise. You have been an effective hinderer but I will be a helper you have been that old serpent but I am as the serpent that was lifted up for men's healing you have been an adversary to my people but now I'm their advocate you have functioned as an angel of light but I am the light of the world you have been the accuser of the brethren but I am now their counselor both the armies of hell and of heaven watched as Jesus systematically ripped off one star after another from Satan's uniform. I hereby strip your title of prince of this world and declare that I am both a prince and a savior. I am the prince of life. I am the king of kings and the lord of lords. You were created as one of the sons of God, but I am the son of God. You have lost everything my father gave you. They are now my possessions. Behold, behold. Behold the conquering lamb as he lifts up the symbols of position and rank in full sight of hell's armies while Satan is required to remain at attention, stripped, humiliated, and divested of all authority. Behold the conquering lamb. Satan and his entire kingdom are defeated. All his power has been stripped from him. You're not hearing me. All his power has been stripped from him. Any authority he ever had has been transferred back to Jesus. Any kingdom over which he held sway are now the kingdoms of Jesus. Behold the conquering lamb. Satan and his legions are once and for all defeated. The roaring lion has had his teeth pulled and he's on a leash to the lion of the tribe of Judah. Oh, how I wish somebody would grasp the significance of this message today. you would get your eyes just a little bit higher than your problem just when you feel like you can't go another step behold the lamb just when you think all hope is lost behold the lamb just when you think evil will prevail behold the lamb I tell you if you're weary of the struggle behold the lamb if you're lonely and afraid behold the lamb if you're bound and defeated Behold the Lamb. If you're discouraged and depressed, behold the Lamb. If you're oppressed and anxious, behold the Lamb. If you're sick, behold the Lamb. If you're grieving, behold the Lamb. If you're desperate for relief, behold the Lamb. If, if you're caught in a trap from which you can't escape, behold the Lamb. If you think you're losing your mind, Behold the Lamb. If you're out of resources, behold the Lamb. If you have no way out and nowhere to turn, behold the Lamb. Why are you worried about a time of tribulation? Behold the Lamb. Why are you troubled about inflation? Or about war? Or about a culture that is anti-God and anti-Christ? Behold the Lamb. 
Why are you anxious about the cares of tomorrow over which you have absolutely no control? Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. The Lamb has overcome. He is in you. You are in Him because He has overcome. Then you can overcome. Revelation 12, 11 gives the key to your overcoming when it declares, and they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. I wish somebody would just join me today and give praise to the lamb. I wish you'd get your eyes a little bit higher than your circumstances and behold the Lamb. The Lamb is worthy. And I'm here to tell you, I just came to this pulpit if for no other reason than to tell somebody, you're going to make it. The Lamb has overcome.